Um, so, so I study a bacteria called Helicobacter pylori, and one of the cool things about this bacteria is that it was the first and still so far the only bacteria that has been listed by the World Health Organization as a carcinogen. And I'm going to get uh, into that aspect of its biology a little bit later, but the, the first uh, fact that I want to tell you about, um, about Helicobacter pylori is that the stomach is not a sterile environment because that is where Helicobacter pylori lives. And just to get you oriented, um, I want to consider actually uh, bacteria in the context of the human body, the whole human body. And to point out this fact that you may or may not have uh, already heard before, which is that, that our bodies are composed of 10 trillion cells. And uh, people always tell you when you talk to non-scientists that you need to frame things in, in terms that they can understand. And 10 trillion is actually kind of a hard number to comprehend, except for lately we hear a lot about 10 trillion or 12 trillion because that's the national debt. And then also we've been hearing about trillions floating around because of the Greek financial crisis. So, um, so you could think of the national debt as representing one dollar for each of your cells, and that's about how many cells you have in your body. And so maybe then it's not such a scary number, I don't know. But the other interesting thing is that you actually have a hundred trillion bacterial cells on and in your body. So in fact, you are a consortium of human cells and bacterial cells. And the other interesting thing about the bacterial population on and inside us is that it is a very diverse uh, group of bacteria. So there's, the, we actually don't know how many ba different kinds of bacteria live on and in this. This is an area of very active research and in fact there's a, there's a fairly new initiative from the National Institutes of Health called the Human Microbiome Project which is trying to m um, basically identify um, and lo locate all the different bacteria that are living on and in us. But we think that there's at least a thousand, maybe even, there might even be a thousand actually in our intestines, so it might be many more that are, that are on and in us. So um, if, you, if you think about that in terms of genes, this becomes interesting too because we humans have about 20,000 genes, give or take, and most bacteria have on the order of one to 10,000 genes, but now if you multiply that by a couple of thousand bacteria, we also have more bacterial genes governing our existence as well as we have human genes. So this is a really important part of understanding human health and disease is to understand the bacteria and other microbes that live on and in us. Okay, so where do these bacteria live? Well, they live lots of places. They live on our skin, in our um, eyes, um, in our mouths. We have a huge population in our mouth, and probably the, um, the largest population is actually in our intestines, where they help, um, help us digest our food, make important uh, cofactors that we need, some, vitam some essential vitamins that we need. Um, but interestingly, people had always thought the stomach was a sterile environment. And um, can it, does anybody know why that is? Acid. So everybody's saying acid. And that's not a bad idea. And oh, the, picture, the cartoon on this side is just supposed to represent that diversity of bacteria. But um, oh, you know what? This is funny. Some of my slides got a little bit out of order. Um, but it turns out you might think that acid would be bad for bacteria, but um, as we've studied bacteria in, in the environment, we've discovered that bacteria can live in lots of strange places, including these acidic pools in places like Yellowstone Park. And, um, and this picture on top here actually sh shows these, um, these thermal vents that are uh, deep in the ocean, and these are chock full of bacteria. So bacteria can live in very extreme environments, um, which might include the stomach. But, um, but my fact number two, which got out of order, basically shows you uh, the, the two people that discovered Helicobacter pylori and showed that it live in, lived in the stomach. And um, when Barry Marshall and Robin Warren reported in the Australian Journal of, Microbi of Medicine, excuse me, that, um, that they had cultured this organism, people didn't believe them. So why do you think people didn't believe them? you have a guess? Yeah. 
Um, part of it was because they thought the stomach was sterile. But, but as I said, um, basically other research that was coming out at the time that showed that bacteria could live in, in um, such strange environments shouldn't have made that such a big leap. But the real problem was is that these guys, not only did they say that there was a bacteria that lived in the stomach, they said that it was causing stomach ulcers. So what they did is, is Barry Marshall had a hypothesis that, um, that he thought that stomach ulcers, which is, a, which is a really bad problem that can cause you a lot of discomfort and can actually kill you, um, he thought that stomach ulcers weren't caused by stress, but that they were caused by this um, bacterium that, he, that people had been reporting seeing in the stomach for a long time, but people didn't think was a resident there. They thought it was just passing through, maybe carried in on food or on the mouth, and they didn't think that, that it was really living in the stomach. And it was really this, this, um, this kind of heretical idea that this chronic disease, ulcers, could be caused by bacteria, which, um, which caused so much problems. And, and then there's another reason which you can focus on if you're cynical, um, and that is, well, um, because at the time, the medical community felt that they knew, they knew what caused ulcers, stress, maybe diet, but more importantly, that they had a good way to control ulcers. So um, if you have an ulcer, uh, in the 70s and 80s, what did you do to treat your ulcer? Anybody know? Sorry? M milk of magnesia. So basically you, actually even more, so milk of magnesia was the early drug, but then came along the proton pump inhibitors, and they had really good drugs for controlling acid, and um, that would relieve your symptoms. And, um, and from the pharmaceutical industry standpoint, it's a perfect drug because how long do you have to take this drug? The rest of your life. So it's got a great marketing plan. And so uh, what Marshall and Warren were proposing was that stomach ulcers were instead caused by a bacterial infection. And if you have a bacterial infection, what do you do? Take antibiotics. And if you get rid of the cause, and so how long does a course of antibiotics take? A week, I'm going to tell you later, for helicobacter it's actually two weeks, but still, two <laughs> weeks is not the rest of your life. So, um, so that, was, that was a bit of a problem, and, um, and, and, and these guys definitely sort of felt a little bit like Don Quixote, you know, jousting with windmills for a while. And, um, and, and the other thing, too, that was a little bit problematic even, you know, so I've been sort of railing like, you know, on this conspiracy about doctors and, and um, the pharmaceutical industry, but there was a lot of, a lot of um, maybe less vested uh, scientists that also questioned this finding, and that was because they were concerned that, that Marshall and Warren were sort of ignoring a fundamental principle in biology. And that leads, uh, leads me to tell you just a little bit about one of the great microbiologists of, um, of the 19th century, and that was Robert Koch. So Robert Koch was a German scientist. He was, um, he was very important to the field of microbiology, sort of like Louis Pasteur, who some of you may have heard of as well. And, um, and Koch did a lot of great things. This is actually a, a drawing of him in his laboratory, which is, um, which is actually appropriate because a lot of what he did was figure out ways for us to be able to actually see bacteria, figure out ways to culture them, to grow them, and to stain them so that we could see them in a microscope. And one of the other things he did was he was a very uh, deep thinker, and he, um, he tried to establish a scientific framework to establish a bacteria as a cause of disease. And, these, um, and he developed these things called Koch's postulates, which, um, which basically are a set of rules for associating a bacteria with disease. And I'm just going to read them here um, because we're going to think about them in the context of helicobacter and stomach ulcers. So, um, so uh, Koch's first postulate was that an um, organism must be associated with a disease legion. So um, Marshall and Warren actually, in their experiments, what they did is they took uh, biopsy material. So that is, um, they took little pieces of stomach 
material that had been isolated from patients with ulcer disease, and they grew, um, they grew out Helicobacter pylori, this, this bacteria, from them. So that was the first postulate. And then the second postulate is that you must isolate the organism in pure culture. So you remember at the beginning of the talk that I said that we have more than a thousand different kinds of bacteria living on and in us. So, um, so just because you grow a bacteria, is that really the right one? What if there's a bunch of other bacteria that are also at the site? Is it the one that you think it is, or is it a different one that grows with it? So, they, so he said that you have to get a pure culture of said organism. And then the really tricky one is number three, where um, Koch says that then you have to administer this pure culture of organisms into an animal or human and get the disease. So you have to basically take this pure culture and then administer it to a naive host and reproduce the, that disease. Now it was a little easier to do experiments on humans back in Koch's day. Now it's pretty hard, um, but we can use animal models to study diseases because um, some, because some uh, bacteria will cause disease in multiple, um, multiple different kind of animals. But actually it turns out that's actually difficult for Helicobacter pylori because it is exquisitely adapted to live in humans and some non-human primates. So, um, so we actually use a mouse model of infection in the lab, but it's really lousy. It's not a good model for the human disease. So, um, so three is pretty difficult. Although, what Ma Barry Marshall did was to actually drink a culture of Helicobacter pylori, and in fact, um, Marshall and Warren actually won the Nobel Prize for their discovery of Helicobacter in 2005, and, and that paper is cited in his Nobel um, award. Um, so he drank a culture of Helicobacter pylori, but he got an upset stomach, he got a little bit of inflammation, and then he treated himself. And um, so he didn't really get an ulcer. And then um, the last part of it is that the organism must be re-isolated from the experimentally infected animal's disease lesion to really prove the whole cycle of it, that, the, that the disease is really caused by, um, by um, that organism. And that part wasn't done for, um, for Helicobacter either. Um, and I should just mention that, uh, that actually uh, Robert Koch won the Nobel Prize in 1905, so 100 years before uh, Marshall and Warren, for his studies, although he didn't really fully fulfill Koch's postulates on the cause of mycobacterium tuber of tuberculosis, which is the bacteria mycobacterium tuberculosis. But anyway, so, but it turns out that people didn't really uh, believe Marshall and Warren until uh, basically there were some clinical trials where they pitted these proton and pump inhibitors, which is represented by the bottle of omeprazole, against antibiotics. And basically what they found was that people that took a course of antibiotics and were able to get rid of their helicobacter infection not only got rid of their ulcers, but their ulcers didn't recur. So when you take proton pump inhibitors or other drugs to limit stomach acid, you still have this problem of recurring ulcers. And really that was what got people finally convinced that Helicobacter really was a cause for ulcers. But, um, so anyway, and, and that also has shifted our thinking too in thinking about how we can look at other chronic diseases that might have a bacterial cause and, um, and thinking about how to study that because of this problem about not, you can't reproduce all diseases in an animal system and or it might be unethical to, um, to infect humans to try to prove your case that this, this business of treating with an antibiotic and, and removing a bacteria, that that can be used as additional evidence to establish causality for disease. Okay. So the next thing that I wanted to mention is that Helicobacter pylori infection is actually really common. So even though this bacteria was only um, identified in the mid-80s, it turns out it's a hugely common infection and it's estimated that half of the world's population is infected with this bacterium. And this map gives you a rough picture of the um, infection rates in different parts of the world. And I hope you can see that it's not the same everywhere. You can see infection rates are um, actually lowest in places like the U.S. and Western Europe in develop, more developed uh, nations. 
and, and lower in developing um, nations. The other cool part of fact number three is that you can actually predict your ancestry better from the helicobacter strain that you harbor than your own DNA. Now this is actually kind of a complex um, concept here, um, which uh, we can maybe go into more in the, in the question and answer period, but I just want to give you a bit of a flavor of this. So, um, so it turns out that almost everybody in the world is infected with helicobacter pylori. And then when people started looking at different strains of the bacteria to figure out if there were um, you know, particular strains that were really associated with bad disease, like we see um, in diseases like cholera, where you have these, these you know, bad strains that, that take off, or, or like another example would be like the jack-in-the-box strain of E. coli, which you know, is a particular clone that carries a toxin that causes a bunch of disease. What they found with helicobacter is that every person seemed to carry their own unique strain. And, and if, you know, if they looked at strains from different people, they didn't really look like, like each other. But they started to see patterns when they looked at strains within families. And then uh, um, what some researchers did was to collect helicobacter strains from all these different parts of the world and analyze the sequence of the, of the bacterial genome. And what they discovered is, is that strains that were from um, similar regions looked more like each other, and they did this really complex statistical analysis where they looked at a bunch of different genes, and based on those sequences, they could basically kind of get a pedigree. And they saw these different, different kind of strain types, and you can see that the strains in Asia had a lot of this kind of yellowish, greenish color and that in Africa you had most of this blue, although then there was another group that were these like very red dominated strains. And then when they looked at the patterns of strains across different places, what they realized is that you could see this sort of mixing which mirrored the major migrations that humans have made out of Africa and to populate Asia and Europe and then and then you can see also that the, that the strains of the, in, of the native Alaskans in Alaska actually look more like the Asian strains. And, um, and people have been getting a lot of mileage out of this. And there was actually, um, just last year, a really interesting paper where they looked at the peopling of the Pacific, which has been a major um, conundrum of exactly how that happened. If there was a, a wave that came from Asia sort of when, when, the, when the seas were lower and there was more of a land bridge, whether they came into Australia and then into New Zealand or whether there were two separate migrations. And then there's been another th theory that everything came out to the, like Fiji and things came through Taiwan. And basically by studying the helicobacter strains, um, they, they basically proposed a route through Taiwan and then an independent analysis looking at linguistics by looking at languages actually came up with the same um, theory and so now that's basically the accepted idea about how the, the, pe the Pacific was peopled because there's this sort of convergence of these two independent measures of humans, what bacteria they carry and what language they have that supports the same wave of migration. So study of bacteria can be used for anthropology. Okay, so fact number four that I want to emphasize is that not everybody that's infected gets disease. So I told you that, that Marshall and Warren won the Nobel Prize for helicobacter being associated with ulcer disease, but then I also told you that half the world is infected with helicobacter pylori, and not everybody that's infected gets ulcers. So this Venn diagram illustrates the picture of what's going on in the U.S. So if you divided the, the U.S. population and those that are, that are helicobacter pylori infected, in the purple and the H. pylori not infected would be the green. You can see that the vast majority of duodenal ulcer, so duodenal ulcer is ulcer that's located basically at the bottom of the stomach in the first part of the small intestine, is associated with helicobacter pylori infection. As is the majority of gastric ulcer, which is a little higher up in the stomach, um, and then what you can also see here in this figure is that most gastric cancer is associated with helicobacter pylori infection. 
And there's an, actually two types of cancer that are associated with helicobacter infection, a gastric adenocarcinoma, which is um, a, a cancer that derives from the, the cells that line the stomach, as well as a gastric lymphoma. So a lymphoma is, is basically a cancer of your immune cells. And so this is um, basically immune cells that are in your stomach that make a, a tumor. That, um, and, and one of the things that's really interesting about this gastric lymphoma is that even at very late stage, stages, if you um, eradicate the infection, so get, take the antibiotics and get rid of the bacteria, you can cause regression of the lymphoma. So make the lymphoma go away. So that's, uh, that's cool fact number four. And then um, the last uh, point that I wanted to make is that um, we know that Helicobacter has been with humans for a very long time. I mentioned how it's been with us since before we came out of Africa and has, you know, and, and has been co-evolving with the human host. And one of the sort of most interesting recent areas of Helicobacter pylori research is this idea that Helicobacter pylori infection may be protective against some diseases. So, you know, when Helicobacter was first discovered, nobody believed it. And then um, after the clinical trials, pitting um, the old drugs to antibiotics, uh, people started, the medical community kind of got more behind it. And then there was this cry of there's no good helicobacter but a dead helicobacter. But then there was these voices that said, but wait a second, helicobacter's been with humans for such a long time. You know, maybe it's, maybe there's good things about it. And um, people started looking at, um, at, at uh, various diseases, and one of the things that they discovered is that um, one of the fastest growing cancers in the U.S. in particular is esophageal cancer, which is um, basically cancer of the esophagus, which is right above the stomach. And, um, and it turns out that, that, uh, that, the, that infection, you're more likely to get esophageal cancer if you don't have Helicobacter pylori infection than if you do. And similarly, um, there's this big epidemic in the U.S. of, um, of increasing asthma, and, um, and one of the early researchers, a guy named Martin Blazer, um, who was originally at Vanderbilt and now he's at New York, um, that, that basically did a lot of the early work on Helicobacter pylori, has um, now been looking at asthma in kids and, um, and thinks that, that, that Helicobacter infection when you're young actually may make you less likely to get asthma. So, um, so I'm gonna just leave you with that. Yeah? Is it correlation or causation? That, at this point, it is correlation, not causation. So, um, and we could talk about, I mean, you know, so when you have a correlation, you know, what, whether you, how you decide whether that's something that should be followed up or not. And one of the things is, is there a plausible biological mechanism that you could explain it and then presumably test to see if your correlation is in fact worth anything or not. Um, we can talk about that a little bit later too. But anyway, so those are my five little tidbits about Helicobacter pylori and um, I think we could take a break. Do you know what kind of, um, I guess, biological conditions trigger the H. pylori to cause cancer? The short answer is no. <laughs> but we, ha we, we do know some things. So, so, um, so we know that it's a complex interplay between the bacterium the host, and probably environmental factors as well. One of the things that's interesting is that, um, you know, I showed, I showed this map of different incidents of Helicobacter pylori infection. If you look at gastric cancer rates, those are also very different from country to country. But that doesn't necessarily correlate with the rates of Helicobacter infection. So there are some places, like in Africa, where you have very high rates of Helicobacter infection, but not much gastric cancer, and then there's countries like Costa Rica and Colombia and actually um, also Korea and Japan that have very high rates of, um, of gastric cancer and moderate to high rates of helicobacter infection. So we know that there are some host genes that make you more likely to get helicobacter infection 
uh, sorry, get to get gastric cancer if you have Helicobacter infection. And we also know that there are differences in the strains of bacteria that, you know, some strains are more likely to be associated with or have a stronger association with cancer than others, certain genes in those strains. But, um, but at this point, we don't have a complete, uh, a complete understanding of that. As a follow-up, then, is there a certain age where that seems to hit and maybe the life expectancy in that country, in Africa, doesn't reach that age and doesn't develop? That's a, that's, a, that's a very reasonable question um, because we think of gastric cancer as, um, as being a disease that's, that's late and cancer in general is an increasing problem as, um, as our population ages more. So, so in Africa you could have two things. You could, also, you could have ascertainment bias too that maybe people aren't looking for gastric cancer. People die of other things and they don't, they don't get to an age where they could get gastric cancer or people aren't even looking for that as a cause of death. Um, but interestingly, uh, there is some gastric cancer that actually strikes quite young, and that also is associated with helicobacter infection. So, so one of the problems is, is that it's a heterogeneous disease, and, and it looks like um, helicobacter is associated with pretty much all forms of gastric cancer, but, but here again, there's just a lot of gaps in knowledge still. Yeah? How does the helicobacter get into the human like I know elephants eat dung when they're little because that's how they get their right. flora and fauna they need internally what mm -hmm. how do people get it right so so that's an excellent question um, what is the route of transmission of helicobacter pylori and um, and you brought up an oral fecal route um, which is a common mode of infection even for humans. So actually most diarrheal diseases are actually thought to be acquired through the oral fecal route. Basically what happens is you've got either contaminated water or contaminated food, say from farming practices, where fecal material is used for fertilization, and the food gets contaminated, and then you ingest it. Um, we don't exactly know the route of transmission of Helicobacter pylori, but it does require very close contact. And it's actually most likely an oral oral route. And um, I like to, st uh, there's a colleague of mine at Stanford that did a really interesting study that I call the spit, vomit, poop study, <laughs> um, where she basically tried to culture uh, helicobacter from these various different sources. Because people have detected helicobacter DNA in your mouth, but it doesn't seem to survive very well in the oral cavity. And similarly, you can detect helicobacter DNA in stool, but um, uh, I didn't really go into this, but, but helicobacter pylori can survive the acid of the stomach, but it actually doesn't like acid. There are some acidophile bacteria, acid-loving bacteria, but H. pylori is not one of them. Um, it, can, it has specific strategies to deal with acid, uh, but it likes a neutral situation, and it actually really doesn't like the more basic or alkali pH of the lower intestine, so it actually doesn't survive in stool. Um, but the best place to get uh, to culture helicobacter actually was from vomit or even from little filters placed away for where somebody was vomiting and the aerosol um, basically transported to the filter and they could grow helicobacter from there. So you might be thinking to yourself, but how does an oral oral route of transmission really work? Um, Okay, maybe transmission within families. But the other thing that we know is that the age of acquisition of helicobacter infection is actually usually quite early. It's, it's when you're kids. And if you just step, well, first of all, if you have children, you might already be understanding the oral oral route <laughs> um, as you, you know, they stick their hand in your mouth. But, um, but then also just think back just like 100, 200 years ago before we had, you know, lots of bottles and baby food and, you know, just go to the store and get baby food. Um, actually, pre-mastication of food was a pretty, is a, and in some cultures still is a very common way of, of feeding young children. And so that, you know, oral, oral is like right there. So, um, and then, you know, cultures where there's sh a shared common pot, shared utensils, suddenly things, it's a... Uh, I can't have for everybody. All right, okay, this was clearly too easy. So I've got, fortunately I have six. So mm -hmm. I saw a hand there, yes? All right, and a hand there. All right, excellent. I'll go pass these out now.
Okay, you have the next question. Yeah, in the introduction, you mentioned that Helicobacter pylori was a carcinogen, has been classified as one. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Right, so, um, so the World Health Organization in 1994 listed Helicobacter pylori as a carcinogen. Um, and, and basically that is because its infection is associated with a, with a greater risk for developing gastric cancer. So, um, and, and it's interesting because the, the degree of risk is about at the level of cigarettes for lung cancer and some other cancers. So, um, so well, anyway, there could be other follow-ups to that, but I won't, I'll let you guys ask the questions. Hi there. How can I have my H. pylori checked for my deep ancestry? How, so, um, so basically, if well, the first thing that you need to do is to um, figure out whether you're infected with Helicobacter pylori. <laughs> and if you are infected with Helicobacter pylori, then um, what they do is they actually um, look at the sequence of 10 different genes in the Helicobacter pylori genome, and they look at those sequences. And then they, they basically, they don't sequence the whole gene, it's a little part of these different, so it's you know, basically a couple hundred base pairs at different points in the genome. And they actually concatenate all those sequences into like a big row. And then they look, and then they, then they basically throw that data into this big um, database that has all these sequences from strains in all these different places, and then they run a computer program that basically looks to see what it matches the most. And different, different of those sequences are, are um, characteristic of strains from these different regions. And that's the same, I mean, you would, you could, that's a, it's the same approach that you would do to use your own DNA. So the, the tricky thing is with these genealogy studies, you know, so there's a lot of, lots of companies that you can give your spit and, and they do this. And basically what they do is they sequence little pieces of, um, our DNA, either our, from our chromosome or our mitochondrial DNA, and they need things that are, um, are, are changing because it turns out that our sequences are actually fairly homogeneous. We do have differences, but not, not differences that are sort of fixed in different lineages that are informative. And so, um, so it turns out that there's not enough variation in most of the genes in our genes so they use like some pieces of the Y chromosome and, and also this mitochondrial DNA, and just the resolution isn't that good. There's more differences in the helicobacter genes, which allows this finer discrimination. There's a fascinating study where they actually looked at people in um, Ladakh, and so you have these Hindu and Muslim populations that are living in pro close proximity, and here again, the helicobacter strains perfectly distinguish those communities, which um, basically says that that this um, it, th this also sort of emphasizes this point that that strains are really only shared among close household members because if it was just in the community, if it was just due like to a contaminated well, everybody would be sharing the same strains no matter what your religion. Yeah. Okay, that's an excellent question. So, so the question was, um, um, has, how long has Helicobacter pylori been with humans? Did it, did it predate humans? Um, and um, and that's, a, that's a great question. So those are kind of hard questions to answer because we don't exactly know what the molecular clock is. But at this point, we think that, that that Helicobacter has been with humans probably since we were recognizably modern humans. Um, H. pylori actually does naturally infect some non-human primates as well, um, although um, uh, that hasn't been really studied that extensively. So, um, so, and the other thing is, is that that most mammals have their own Helicobacters. So, um, so it, it is likely that that even further back in time, there were Helicobacters, but not necessarily Helicobacter pylori, the species that's now with us. 
But um, for example, dolphins have their own helicobacters, Helicobacter senatorum, that, um, that are associated with ulcer disease as well. What, if any, um, impact does the bacteria have on autoimmune diseases like HIV or the less or more benign ones like lupus or MS or ones that aren't quite as fatal? Okay, so that's that's an interesting question. Um, so, I mean, you could think of um, some asthma and allergy as. Um, well, that's actually not really an autoimmune disease. So, so, so um, at this point, there isn't any major association. There are um, some associations of related bacterial infections with autoimmune disease. Um, so Helicobacter is closely related to a pathogen called Campylobacter jejuni, which actually causes diarrhea. Um, it's the most common cause of diarrhea in um, actually places like the U.S. and Western Europe. And in that case, that's a very transient infection. That bacteria normally lives in wild birds and, um, and domestic birds and some domestic cattle. And um, interestingly, when that bacteria infects, it, the, its surface is coated with some molecules that look like um, proteins that are actually sugars that we have on our cells. And that is associated with, um, with uh, basically a neurological disease called Guillain-Barre syn syndrome, which is an autoimmune disease. Um, but so far, there isn't an association with helicobacter. Now, the HIV question is an interesting one because there are, there are, there are some chronic bacterial infections that are um, basically uh, have a higher incidence in people that are immunocompromised due to infections like HIV. So TB is a big one, for example, and a number of fungal infections that have become a big problem since the HIV ep epidemic. Interestingly, Helicobacter, so, so in, the, in this case is basically bacteria such as TB, which can be latent in the body because the immune system is, is basically controlling that infection. In a situation like HIV where the immune system is dampened, now the bacteria gains the upper hand and can now cause problems. Helicobacter, as part of its lifestyle, actually seems to require uh, the immune system and, um, and a particularly uh, kind of a, a type of immunity that we refer to as Th1. And, um, and so it actually um, doesn't have increased uh, symptoms or, or um, severity of disease with HIV. And in fact, um, helico there's a recent study that suggests that helicobacter infection actually uh, make, can make you more likely to control your TB infection because it, it, it kind of activates the immune system into this kind of aggressive stance, which, um, which helps suppress other infections like tuberculosis. So if, if you have an illness where you're, like in MS, where the, mm -hmm. um, the immune system has gone berserk or yes. crazy, would then it heightening the immune system, would it worsen the, the, the possible helicobacter. damage from the MS? Um, it's possible, although I haven't seen any studies in that regard. Um, yeah, so I, I, it is possible, but I, I don't know. I don't know that anybody's actually carefully looked at that. In the back, can you talk a little bit about the pathway between um, Heliobacter pylori infection and and the cancer itself? Okay. Um, so the question is: Is what's the pathway? A little more discussion about the pathway between Helicobacter pylori infection and cancer. So. Um, so what we understand about the etiology of gastric cancer has really come from careful study by pathologists, and there is thought to be a pathway that is at play where um, there are some, uh, there's basically some tissue alterations that happen in the stomach. So normally the stomach is composed of several different cell types, 
um, including um, the parietal cells, which are the acid-producing cells, so they make the hydrochloric acid that gets out into the lumen. Then there are uh, things called chief cells, the, the, the cells that make the, um, the enzymes that help digest our food. And then another major cell type in the stomach is the, muc the mucosal cell, which basically secretes this very thick um, gastric mucus that coats our uh, stomach lining to protect our body cells from that acid. And this, this mucus is so thick, it's like, it's more like, it's like a gel, like jello, rather than, you know, we're like thinking about snot. And, um, and it's actually so thick that it, 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 it slows the back diffusion of the acid. So the acid gets out and then doesn't come back. And so actually where Helicobacter pylori lives is, is right up next to the, to the cells in that thick mucus. Because remember I said that it actually doesn't really like acid. Um, so what people, what the pathologists have described, and this, this is called the, Korea, the Korea model after Paleo Korea, who's a, a pathologist from Columbia that, that really nicely described this, this pathway, is that, is that um, what you first see is this chronic inflammation. So, and this is thought to be driven by Helicobacter pylori infection because the, the, our body recognizes that there's this bacteria there that shouldn't be there and it mounts an immune response and recruits inflammatory cells to the stomach and makes antibodies, but for whatever reason, it's not effective at clearing the bacteria. And in fact, the bacteria seem to require this to help establish their niche. Maybe that damage is, is, is the cells dying and also um, disrupting the integrity of that, uh, that layer of cells is causing food to leak out that might be helping the bugs. Anyway, so you have this chronic inflammation, and then eventually what you start to get is a condition called atrophy, where basically you start to lose cell types. And the, one of the characteristic ones is loss of these parietal cells, which are these giant, they're kind of like kind of, um, they stain lighter with the, with the dyes that we use to stain the tissue, and they, they have a really big shape, so you can really tell when they're gone. Um, and so you lose the parietal cells and also some of the zymogenic cells, and then you get expansion of these mucus secreting cells. And then um, as you, and now the, the, the gastric glands start to, um, and you've still got all these, in, these inflammatory cells coming in, and so now the, the nice architecture of the glands starts to get disrupted. You actually get um, a thickening of the stomach lining um, where you're getting enhanced proliferation of these mucus cells, and now they start to n not look like normal gastric mucus, cel mu mucus cells, and they start to secrete different mucins that m are more like the mucins that are secreted, that are made in the intestine. And so this condition is called intestinal metaplasia. And then, um, then after you start to see this intestinal metaplasia, then you, s you can see what's called dysplasia, where now the cells are really starting to look funny and, um, and grow aberrantly. And then you can get basically um, start to get invasion. And once the cells basically invade below the normal surface, that's when you get into a situation that would be described as cancer. So Helicobacter pylori is thought to be very an, an early event, that it's basically starting this cascade by causing this pers persistent inflammation. And one of the major questions has been is, um, is to what extent this pathway is reversible. So we know, for example, in the case of smoking and, um, and lung cancer, that if you stop smoking, mm -hmm. you know, within a certain number of years, you, you know, th I mean, the, the, um, the NIH, they have a nice, I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but they can kind of tell you how much, you know, how many years of cigarette-free, how much your risk lowers. We don't really know that for Helicobacter pylori infection. In fact, um, one of the best studies has been by actually this, the same scientist I mentioned, Paleo Korea, did, has had a, one of the longest studies where they actually tried eradicating um, Helicobacter infection in people in Colombia, which happens to be one of these countries where you have a really high risk of gastric cancer, particularly up in the mountains. Um, so they, they, they got people that had some of these um, pre-neoplastic lesions.
so atrophy and intestinal metaplasia, and then they eradicated their helicobacter infection and then followed them over time to see if their, if their um, lesions progressed. They didn't really look at cancer as an outcome, they just looked at their, um, what, their, what the pathology of the stomach looked like over time, because they can take these biopsies by endoscopy. And, um, and in that study, they found that, that um, only after long follow-up, after 12 years, they really started to see a difference between the people that were treated versus the people that got rid of their helicobacter versus not getting rid of their helicobacter. So there was basically an effect with the square of the time of being helicobacter-free leading to less less progression and more regression of pathology. So that's really the, the, the only study that has started to sort of look at the reversibility of that process. There's a question over here. Thanks, it sounds like there's areas where the uh, H. pylori is being looked at as a therapeutic or not. Um, as a so, therapy. As a therapeutic. It sounds like you, you said there are certain situations where it's involved and you have less chance or well, maybe the so question that's, is, that's is there still, research going on? The, in that well, area? so that's, that's still, pr that's pretty new um, research. So, um, so these, these more recent associations of, you know, saying, okay, look, th there might be um, good sides to helicobacter infection have really only come out in the last couple of years. Um, actually, in my lab, we just, we just got a little pilot grant to, um, to start to look at this problem in the esophageal cancer situation, um, partly capitalizing on a unique opportunity that, um, that one of my colleagues at the center has one of the largest cohorts of, of um, people with, eso with the, the sort of pre-cancer condition for esophageal adenocarcinoma, which is something called Barrett's esophagus. And so there's the Seattle Barrett's esophagus cohort. So, um, so we, we wanna, we have a hypothesis about why this might be going on. And our idea is that maybe when you get rid of helicobacter in your stomach, something else can come in. And that maybe the reason that helicobacter is protective for esophageal cancer is that it's excluding another infection that might be causal to esophageal adenocarcinoma. Um, when, the, when the association with this negative association between helicobacter infection and, and um, esophageal adenocarcinoma first came out, the, the explanation that was put forward actually had to do with acid because the biggest risk factor for getting esophageal adenocarcinoma is acid reflux, which is when stomach contents basically come up into the esophagus because the um, valve at the top of the stomach isn't working properly. And, um, and then it's thought that this, this um, constant acid exposure basically erodes at the stomach and then you actually, similar to what I just described in the stomach, you actually then get this condition called Barrett's esophagus where now the normal squamous epithelium of the esophagus re gets replaced by mucus producing cells that look more like intestinal cells. Um, and, then, and then that's a risk factor for then getting um, uh, esophageal adenocarcinoma. Now there was a couple of really interesting studies. So, so, so the idea there is, is that sometimes when you have helicobacter infection, as I mentioned, you can get atrophy in the stomach where you lose the parietal cells, which are the guys that are making the acid. So in that situation, if you have helicobacter infection, you might have less acid, less reflux, less disease. If that, so it turns out that the situation with helicobacter is complicated because remember one of the, big, the biggest disease associated with helicobacter infection is actually ulcer where you actually have more acid production. So, um, so maybe different infections make you more or less likely to get atrophy. So there was two big studies, one in um, Finland and one actually in California in the Kaiser Permanente cohort where um, they basically said, okay, if it's really acid, if we control for gastric atrophy, we should get rid of this association of helicobacter being protective for esophageal adenocarcinoma. So they used a blood test to look at the ratio of some of these gastric enzymes, pepsinogen one to pepsinogen two, as a marker for atrophy. And when they did that, 
the Helicobacter infection protection was still there. So that suggests that maybe it's not acid, that maybe there's something else to the story. And so that's why we've decided to say, okay, well, let's look to see if there's a new bacteria on the scene. So we're going to do a little study to see if we can find evidence for that or not. So I was just wondering if there was any correlation with the different strains and any of the, um, whether ulcers or the different forms of cancer? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. There's, there's been a lot of work in that area, and um, so far, not much answers. So, so far, most of the, most of the um, gene differences that are associated with um, more, more higher likelihood to get ulcer are also associated with higher likelihood to get cancer. So, um, so at this point, there aren't really any good markers that explain this dichotomy. And, and, it, and I really think that there is a dichotomy. I don't, if, if some of you may remember it on that Venn diagram, one of the things that to me has always been fascinating is if you look at the curves from, you know, just from a strictly epidemiologic sense, duodenal ulcer is protective from gastric cancer. There's no overlap there. People that get duodenal ulcer don't get gastric cancer. People that get gastric ulcer sometimes get gastric cancer. So, and, and if you look at um, here again, the inflammation and the pathology that's associated with these different diseases, when you get duodenal ulcer, the bugs are at the bottom of the stomach in, in a place called the antrum. And in that condition, you, you often actually get increased acid. And in fact, um, the, you get actually um, acid or sorry, stomach looking type cells in the first part of the duodenum and the bacteria move down there too and that's when you get duodenal ulcer. When you get gastric ulcer or gastric cancer, you have this opposite condition where the, the, both the bacteria and the immune cells that are chasing them move up into the body, which is the main acid secreting compartment. So this, the stomach's kind of big and it's kind of, you know, it kind of looks like this. And so the, the middle part is the acid producing part. The tarp right at the top is called the cardia, closest to the heart, and then the bottom is this antrum. So if you get this inflammation up into the body, that's more associated with gastric ulcer and gastric cancer. And so um, I think there probably are differences in the bacteria that result in these different tropisms, this you know, propensity to go to a different spot, but we don't know what they are now at this point. Other questions? Sorry, one more. Um, <clears throat> so past, so some of the strains are past uh, very young. What about uh, like adoption? How does that work as far Ooh, as? That's uh, an excellent question. And in fact, um, in fact, I have a postdoc that has just written a grant to look at this. this because, um, so there's this idea that strains are passed within families, or at least that's the observation. Um, and so the question is, is why is that? Is that because, and I mentioned that there, in fact, there are genetic differences among strains from different groups of people. And so is that because the bacteria has co-evolved with the host? And so therefore, you're more likely to get a strain from your parent because not only do you have close contact, but you also share your genetics. And so the strain is more, you know, adapted to pass to you. Um, or is it something else? There was, a, there was an interesting study that was actually done in, um, in um, some of the townships in South Africa where they looked at transmission. And what they, there what they found was that it was, um, strains were transmitted within households, but not necessarily between people that were, were closely related. So if you had somebody that was living in the same household but wasn't a relative, they still were more likely to share a strain. So what Sarah, a postdoc in my lab, has written a grant for is to actually test that in the U.S. in a different um, kind of population that, um, where we, she was actually wants to enroll um, families with adopted and non-adopted children to see whether, um, to kind of address this issue further about is it really the host genetics or just that very close contact that um, is more likely to, to predict transmission. Yeah. 